All right, here is an example uh, Excel spreadsheet I made to work through uh, a numerical version of the question of comparative advantage. Now, quick recap, the basic idea here is we look at the opportunity costs that two possible trading partners have when we're thinking about trading two different goods, two party, two good economy, uh, and the person, or in this case country, with the comparative advantage uh, in any given good is whoever has the lower opportunity cost in terms of the other good to make that good. So classic example is England and Portugal trading wine and cloth. Here we've got some made up numbers. We'll say England could make as much as 20 units of wine, let's say per year, and 30 units of cloth. And in Portugal, that's 16 units of wine compared to five units of cloth. Now to figure out the trade-off, in this case it's already automatically uh, calculated, but what I find is easy when you see, say, the exam questions where you're not going to have Excel, uh, is the, tr the cost of making 20 units of wine would be 30 units of cloth. So the cost per unit of wine is going to be 30 units of cloth for 20 divided by 20 to give you the per unit cost. Okay. Likewise for cloth, 30 units of cloth costs you 20 units of wine. One unit of cloth costs you 1 30th of that amount. Or, even handier, it's going to be just 1 divided by this other figure. Okay. So when you see the formula here, it says 1 over the other thing. That's just because it's a reciprocal. Whatever the fraction is the other, uh, for the other good, we flip it upside down uh, for cloth in this case. Now for comparative advantage, what's going on in these cells is it's just asking who has the lower trade-off for either good? Who gives up less, uh, less units of cloth per unit of wine? So in this case, Portugal, although they cannot produce as much cloth or wine, for each unit of wine, they give up fewer units of cloth. So if you're looking for wine in this example, you're going to have an easier time getting it in Portugal. Right? If you want to buy wine from a cloth merchant in England, you've got to give them in uh, wine from... If you want to buy wine from an English merchant, you're going to have to give them cloth in exchange. And you're going to have to give them cloth that's commensurate with what they could have produced otherwise. In Portugal, the same deal. If you are a Portuguese person trying to buy wine from a merchant in Portugal, you got to give them some amount of cloth. But the amount of cloth you have to give the Portuguese merchant is less. Uh, for each unit of wine, you have to give them about a third of a unit of cloth to make it worth their while. If you gave them less than that, if they're looking to get cloth, they might as well just make it themselves instead of trading away their valuable wine to you to get your cloth. Right? So why this matters is if you are in England and you've got cloth, you can go to a Portuguese merchant and buy wine from them and you don't have to give them as much cloth as you would to get wine from an English merchant. Right? So the result is we have the possibility that both sides can trade. Now there's sort of two superstitions that show up in modern discussion of international trade, uh, and they're flip sides of each other, and they're both wrong, and they both boil down to zero-sum thinking. Some people would look at, say, U.S. trading with Honduras and say, well, Honduras is not very productive. They are not a super advanced economy like the U.S. is, so if we're trading with them, it must be that they are gaining from trade and we are losing. But that's wrong, and we'll see in a second some of the numbers uh, to describe how that's wrong. The other superstition is, if we are trading with Honduras, it must be that because we're a rich country and they're a poor country, we're taking advantage of them. That is also wrong. Voluntary trade allows both sides to be made better off. So let's go ahead and look at a possible trade here. Now, I find the easiest thing uh, is to look at a trade where one side breaks even and then experiment from there to find the trade that makes both sides better off. 
Right? The textbook kind of starts you off with this part, thinking about what are the trade-offs, and we can find a trading ratio between these two figures that works pretty well. But I think it's a little bit easier and makes me get confused a little bit less uh, to think about it this way, which is, let's start by looking for where England breaks even. So this is not a happy face, it's not a frowny face. If England gives 30 units of cloth, let's try it the other way really quickly. If they give, update these numbers. If England gives 20 units of wine and Portugal gives them back 30 units of cloth, from England's perspective, they have done the equivalent of working for one year, making wine in order to get one year worth of cloth in exchange. They are not gaining, they're not losing. From Portugal's perspective, what's happening is to get 30 units of cloth, they're giving up six years of production. And they're gaining a little bit more than one year's productivity in exchange. Right? So it's easy to see England is moving from one end of their PPF to the other. Right? The max possible production. Let me really quickly give you a graphical version of this. So we got wine and cloth, and what are our numbers? 30 and 20. Right, so here is England. They're producing here, or they can produce here, or they can produce somewhere in between. In this case, they're producing a lot of wine, they're giving it away, and they're getting back a bunch of cloth but they still end up on their PPF. So they're no better off or worse off than before. Uh, for Portugal, their PPF, let me do a different color. I know this is a sloppy graph, but that's not the point. Uh, they are getting a lot of wine, but they're giving up a lot of cloth, right? So they're getting this wine from England, which I guess we have to go down, um, not up they're giving up a lot. Let's get rid of this and just focus on the numbers here. So given this setup, we've got England is spending one year's worth of time making wine, zero years worth of time making cloth, and what they get in exchange is zero years worth of wine and one year worth of cloth. For Portugal, they are spending six years to make the cloth here, so they can only make this trade every six years, and it saves them one and a quarter years for wine. They are losing. They really don't like this trade. So if we flip the direction, now England is giving a year's worth of cloth and getting back a year's worth of wine. They're still breaking even. But now Portugal has a little happy face because they're spending one and a quarter years to save six years time producing cloth, right? They are gaining from trade here. Now all we have to do is change things a little bit to make, to sweeten the deal for England. So let's reduce that, 20, uh, that 30 to a 25. Now they're spending 84% of a year to make cloth and they're getting 100% of a year's worth of wine. Portugal is spending one and a quarter year uh, effort to make wine and they're saving five years worth of effort to make cloth. They can't make this trade every year, but when they do, they're saving a lot more time than they're giving up. This is the essence of comparative advantage. We have England saving time, we have Portugal saving time, and the result is both of them are going to be able to consume more wine and cloth than they could have done without trade. Comparative advantage means that as long as both sides have different trade-offs, as long as these numbers are not the same in both rows, then we have opportunity to gain from trade, even when we have a situation like this where one of the countries is more wealthy and productive than the other. Both sides can be made happy. Both sides can end up more with more than they could have otherwise.